Hi everybody, hope you're well. Today we are going back to last week to the talk that Sebastiano Brandolini, Thomas Weaver and Martino Pedrozzi gave here at Spazio for the launch of Sebastiano's book, The House at Capo d'Orso, published by MIT Press. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. I used to rent this house and uh, at one point uh, I discovered that Tom Weaver was renting another house. I was, I was letting a house and you were renting it. Is that the right order? Of, uh, I discovered that he was um, renting a nearby house belonging to someone else and uh, we, we met each other by chance. And he has a, a special sensitivity for places which are not so common. And so he fell in love with this house and uh, since he confuses, I think, a bit uh, private affairs and business affairs, uh, he thought that because of the small stories I told him right away, he thought that this had a, an architectural significance. And so he commissioned me uh, through MIT Press to write a book about this house, and I, I did this. And maybe now he can... Add something. And yeah, shall I give my version? Your version. Of the same yeah. story. So, yes, I work at MIT Press. So I, I direct all of the art and architecture books for MIT. A few years ago, before I met Sebastiano, I was doing some research into the Italian architect Alberto Pons. And I was working at the Architectural Association in London. Pons, as many of you may know, is the architect who basically invented the vernacular of the Sardinian holiday house, building literally hundreds and hundreds of houses in the north of Sardinia from the 1960s onwards. The English architectural critic, Rainer Bannum, had one very, very famous rule about talking about architecture, which is that you can only talk about it if you've seen it, if you've physically seen it. And this, I must admit, is a rule that I've always broken. You know, I've published lots of things on architecture I've taught about architecture that I've seen only in other books and only on the screen. But when the architecture is in Sardinia and when Sardinia is in the month of July or August and when the sea is warm, I announce to everyone at the AA and around me that I had to go to Sardinia. <laughs> it was a kind of mission. It was a duty. I had no other reason, you know, for my own professional diligence. As an alternative to, to Venice. I had to do it. <laughs> I, I, I was willing to take that burden. So I went to Sardinia actually three times and I conducted a number of interviews with Alberto um, and I published a lot of that work uh, through the Architectural Association. And in a sense, through that process, I developed a relationship with Alberto and his wife, Anna Rita. Um, that also was consummated in me being able to stay in Sardinia in some Alberto Pones houses. Um, so a year later, I spent a memorable week in one of Alberto's earlier houses in July with my family. And actually, during that week, um, I heard that Sebastiano, someone who I hadn't really met before, but I knew his work because he's the only person who published and written on, Alber on, um, on um, Pones' work before. So I heard that uh, Sebastiano was in the next cove in his own house. And so I reached out to Sebastiano, I got his details, and Sebastiano immediately said, well, come over. Um, come over for a swim, um, some salami, and uh, a glass of wine. Now, I have to admit that swimming, salami, and glasses of wine are maybe my three favorite things. So I, I instantly went over to see Sebastiano we swam together, we ate the salami, we drank wine, and it was my first experience of the house. And the moment I saw Sebastiano's house, or rather Sebastiano's mother's house, to be sort of more precise, um, I forgot all about um, Ponis, I have to say, <laughs> because it was a house that I instantly fell for. And in a way, it was a house that has extremely sort of interesting ambiguities to it. It was a house designed not by an architect, but by a painter, Sebastiano's mother. And it has both a kind of rationalism to it and a kind of cerebral quality, but it also has a kind of idiosyncrasy to it, a sort of eccentricity to it. 
And then I also discovered that there was a sort of interesting ambivalence to Sebastiano himself, <clears throat> who has a certain luxuriousness to him in his civility and in his intelligence, but who's also very accessible, very humble even, down to earth. And so immediately we started to speak about the idea about a book about the house or using the house itself as a vehicle to tell a story, a story about families, about holidays, about Sardinia, and about a kind of architecture that could exist in a landscape like that. I must admit that when I, I work with lots of writers and lots, on lots of publications, and often there's a strange kind of conflict or friction between my idea for a book and then the, the need to get the writer to write that book. Um, but Sebastiano got it instantly, and in a way, the conversations we had were as if, as if it was the continuation of a conversation that we'd been having for years. Sebastiano had clearly been thinking about his ho the house as a book, even if it, it hadn't sort of articulated it as much. And so, it was the easiest commission I've ever done. Um, oh, you um, never told me this. <laughs> Uh, I mean, maybe it was aided by the pandemic and COVID. In a sense, yes, COVID of, was very useful. A very <laughs> useful kind of moment of closure. But um, Sebastiano basically wrote the book in one year. And he wrote it in a way, exactly the way I wanted it to be written. A book that tells a story that has certain uh, derives and sort of um, drifts as it talks about other things. But it endlessly moves in and around the house. So... I must admit, I'm hugely pleased and delighted with the end result. And I've got a feeling that it's going to do very, very well. Well, let's hope so. I, I understand that Mariana has underestimated the sales of tonight. And so it is already esaurito. I would pass the, the word to Martino. Martino is, uh, is, uh, has visited the house. Once or twice, you came, you came once, uh, and uh, he is a Swiss from the Ticino, and he is, uh, uh, I think, the most Spartan person I ever met in my life, uh, in the sense that he, he sort of celebrates uh, the absence of things, but on the other hand, he also, I would say, doesn't like minimalism. So this combination of liking things to be almost absent, but the disliking minimalism is a special combination. And he's a, he's a diligent man, and so he took notes. And uh, so I think that I would pass the, pass the word to him, uh, and uh, hopefully we will be able to activate a conversation Many of the people that I see in the, in the audience have been to the house uh, before I sadly sold it a year ago. Uh, well, not so sadly. I was quite relieved, in fact, <laughs> and, um, for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, especially one of the reasons being that it is too Spartan to live in it. Um, so many of the people have seen this house and uh, so you know maybe some of the people from the floor would also like to 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 say something after after you well yes i visited the house once i was uh, invited by sebastiano and albert and uh, you know when you say that I, I, I like things that are absent, but I don't uh, like the minimalism. I think that your house somehow summarized this, uh, because it's a house that is there, but it's an instrument to appreciate the landscape, what is around, the rocks that are around. This is my feeling. I, I, uh, it's, it's like an instrument. It's not in symbiosis with the, the, the people around. And I was impressed reading your book uh, when uh, I read your, your mother saying that she said goodbye you know, to the rocks for the last uh, time that we had, and we decided not to go back to the house. So at the end, uh, the goal, what you would reach going there, were actually the rocks, and not, not even the, the house. You were there, you were to appreciate and think, and have uh, thoughts about these forms that 
uh, in between the nature and the and agriculture. It's something that you know, we need to be thinking about. So that's that's why I appreciate the definition we gave to myself, and I think that that definition fits perfectly to the hub. Yes, I think that is. Uh, it's a complicated conflict for me, at least, between. Uh, the place the house occupies and the house itself. That the place is, is much more important than the house in the end. But if the place was without the house, it would be completely meaningless. So in the notes which I took, I also thought that uh, my parents, when they built the house in 1960, between 63 and 1964, in a way they, they committed a, a small crime. All of the sailing boats of the Cintrovelica of, Cap of Caprera, which pass in front of the house, and my son Martino confirmed this, defined this house as the abuso, the illegal house. The, uh, the absurdity of this house is that because of this, it is so special. As Tom was saying before, it is a house which uh, is not designed by an architect. And um, I don't know whether I, in a way, I think that's uh, a positive thing. It's a positive thing in the sense that if it had been designed by an architect, it would have probably been something very different from what it is. It would have entered in symbiosis with the place. But since it's been designed as a tool, as an instrument, like if it was a barometer or, th or a thermometer or uh, something, or maybe a metro, and because of this, it clearly it reveals uh, that it's not designed by an architect, but it's designed by something, by someone who was a painter, that is my mother. Now, I don't know if it is, I don't know whether I'm saying, you know, whether things are really like this. But uh, in a way, I think that it does show that it is not designed by an architect. And this, in a way, is quite important. It is at a certain point of your book, you say you don't know if Ponis would have designed it, if he designed it, if your parents would have known him. But, you know, reading the book and, and trying to interpret also the way of life of your parents uh, and following a certain uh, uh, rules, uh, etc., and imagining the architecture of points, which is very, you know, has a yes. great uh, sensuality. Sen sensuality. sensuality. I, I, I was wondering, you know, if the way of being with your parents and your mother would fit into such a you know, hedonistic almost type of architecture like Polis, which is which has this kind of what do you think Tom well, about I, I think I, I think Ponis is both haunts your, this thing. house and is haunted by it. I think as your book <laughs> reveals that Alberto spent a long time sitting, you know, at that table or on the rocks or you know swimming with you, you know, every summer. And in the sense it, it, it's a touchstone, I think, for him. In a way, a, a kind of negative touchstone. It, it's defined by its arches, and I think it, which is the one feature that Ponis never does. He doesn't produce an arch in any of his buildings. So it's clearly not a Ponis house, but there's something about it that is somehow beyond um, what, what Ponis himself created. I don't feel he overtook it in any way. I mean, in my cliched understanding, I still think it's, it's something that transcends what, what he did in the, in the nicest possible way. But I think that there's a strange, interesting relationship between Ponis and this house. I would, uh, I would like uh, to, to ask either Marco Zanuso or Enrico Rosio, who are both uh, sitting in front of me, whose parents, the very same years as this house, six months before, six months after, their parents were among the, the first explorers, the colonizers. Um, and Marco Zanuso uh, is, comes from the renowned Zanuso family in Milan. And uh, Enrico Rosio uh, 
has family has no real ties with architecture but because i think that what we are really talking is about uh, is about uh, the architecture of tourism uh, this is something which um, uh, i'm interested in up to a point but i know that my mother detested the architecture which was made by tourists for tourists and uh, would have never admitted that she was a tourist herself she would have of course you know people who knew her I mean she would have uh, sort of shouted back at you if you dared uh, compare her to the tourists of the Costa Esmeralda but of course there were similarities in that respect as well so I don't know whether Marco or Enrico would like to say something about their houses and what relationship there might be between their houses and this house if you if you want to otherwise I know il buono sgambetto questo <laughs> I would like to speak about our houses, uh, just to tell the story. The two houses are about 10 minutes uh, far uh, southwest from uh, Angelini's house, uh, in the same area of south, south of Capodosso. And there are two houses, the Angelini houses, who were started in 1961. And the first holidays we made were 1963, so exactly the same uh, pioneer period of uh, 1970. So, Marco house uh, was built by Marco Zanetto Sr., architect, architect in the 60s, and uh, my parents' house was built by Nicola Battistretti, who was a friend of Battistretti. So, I do, but I don't want to speak about these two houses, I, I want to uh, go back give back the call to Sebastiano, just to say, it's, it's uh, clear that uh, this was a period of uh, a sort of discovery of Sardinia in terms of the continental, uh, people from the continent. So, uh, the Aga Khan and the Costa Esmeralda started about 1960, so it was the period of the discovery of uh, North of Sardinia. And uh, we had always the sensation, the impression, we were uh, pioneers in a very physical uh, way. Uh, Sanito's house is about uh, 20 meters from the sea, from the water, and our house is about 8 meters. <coughs> so, as I was said before, all these houses were built near the sea in a period where the law permitted it. Today would be absolutely and justly prohibited. So, uh, the experience we both we all share is, is a highly unique experience for Sebastian. What, were, what was your experience as a pioneer of, uh, of this landscape who was uh, almost uh, a virgin, virgin, virgin landscape? Well, uh, my, my memories, which are probably a bit faded and a bit uh, sort of invented, I think, is that we did not go there on holiday. It was more like a summer emigration. It was more like, uh, you know, birds who cross the Sahara Desert to go from uh, Rome to the equatorial forest. So it was a real immigration, and uh, we used to spend, for the first five years, I would say, two and a half months there uh, with uh, servants. So we used to go there in one or two cars. So there were two very active and very, and very you know, sort of problem-solving people who used to come from the Veneto, where my, my father's family came from. Uh, and uh, it was an invention. There was nothing which was planned uh, beforehand. And uh, uh, of course the house was always an infinite source of problems because nothing ever worked. So the water didn't work. For the first 10 years more or less we didn't have electricity. So the, ele so the electricity worked because it, didn't, it wasn't there. You know, everything was a constant source of problem and it was uh, in the same way as uh, Martino was saying earlier it was a place where nothing of what you had done 
the 10 months before would be replicated there. Everything would be different. So you would get up at a different time of the day. You would do different things during the day. Uh, you would uh, experience new food. You would meet eventually new people, including uh, Alberto Ponis, uh, who we never saw uh, except in Sardinia. So at one point, I think, just to contradict myself, at one point, Alberto Ponis did buy a little apartment in Milan because obviously he felt he should do the professional jump from working off Palau to working off Milano. And it was a complete failure. It was a complete failure, and so nine months later, he just sold the flat he had bought in Milan. So everything we did in Sardinia had nothing to do with what we did when we lived in the continent. And this was uh, the notion of a holiday for my parents. I remember my parents complaining of the fact that other Milanese people, when they came to Sardinia, they would see the same people that they had left behind in Milano. But for my parents, it had to be something completely different and in complete contradiction. So I think in this sense is what uh, the idea of holiday was for them. So the two houses were, were really, you know, one is the opposite of the other. This is very clear. Yes, because the second house which my father built, which was designed by Alberto Ponis, was a house which from the start my father had planned to build in order to sell and make some money off that. I'm talking about the, the house in Chisholm. Like if the two were, you know, the two parts of a single house, let's say, extreme, you know, in, in, in one sense, one and in another sense, the other, and needed one to the other in order to live in the Yes. Now, there is only one person, I think, two persons in this audience who knew my mother well. But I think my mother was rather, was rather schizophrenic with regard to this, in a way, yes. Yes, she, she was, uh, I think you're right, that the family house in the Veneto, which is now uh, owned by my brother, and the house in Sardinia were uh, completely different. Yes, completely different. I think one of the things which surprised uh, most people in Sardinia, I don't remember if I mentioned this in the book, maybe very briefly, but I could, you know, uh, I could say more than is in the book, is that this house doesn't have a garden. And this is something which I think is very, very unusual in, uh, for all holiday houses, that there is a complete absence of garden. And so you, you go there and there is nothing which you have to maintain. I mean, the only garden thing was a pot of rosemary which Alberto Ponis used to bring to us at the start of every season. But that was, the, the garden was a pot of rosemary. That's the only thing there was. There was no, nothing else. But even more extraordinary, there's no pool either. Yes. The two great landscape things that define a holiday home. Yes, yes. But, uh, but could you just talk a bit more about your mother though, given that it's so, it, it, it is her creation, is it the house? Uh, my mother um, was uh, originally from South Africa. The legend says that she met my father at Harris Bar in Venice, with uh, Hemingway having his uh, fourth <laughs> Bellini around 12.30. And uh, they both came from uh, complicated family backgrounds. My, my mother from South Africa, I think that... At the age of 16, she realized that Cape Town didn't have the cultural attractions she was uh, seeking. My father was from an aristocratic uh, Venetian family and uh, practically grew up without a mother, suffered a lot because his father wasted all the family money gambling, literally all the family money. Actually, much more than the family money, <laughs> because the banks would just, uh, you know, say, please come in, you know, and, and that was the end of the story. Uh, so I think that the fact that they both originated from 
uh, complicated family backgrounds created a strong uh, collante, how do you say, sort of a, a glue, a bond. glue, a bond. Yes, it's, it's more than a bond, it's a real glue sort of thing uh, between my parents. And uh, the house in Sardinia was a very uh, eloquent result of this kind of bondage, in a way. My mother was uh, very severe, uh, both with herself and with others. I think that all the best friends of my mother have had problems in maintaining a decent relationship with her, including, for example, this person right in front of me, Barbara, because she would have no problem in judging practically everything which passed in front of her eyesight. So she was a very, very strong character. Uh, and uh, she had few friends as a result of this, uh, and, uh, and lots of enemies in a way. But they all, I think, they all admired the determination of my mother in doing what she wanted. And uh, painting was something which she did in a kind of military fashion. So she would start at uh, 8 o'clock and she would finish at 12, and so it was it was a kind of, it was a, it was a military exercise for her. And going to Sardinia was a military exercise. So, you know, doing that swim every day, uh, going to the village every morning at 7.30 in order to fill up with the car with bread and uh, other goodies. Uh, and uh, I think the house in Sardinia, in this sense, it's a rather military house. Uh, it is a military house also in terms of architectural language. It has, you know, straight walls. It can turn into a fortress in uh, just a couple of minutes. And you can just exclude everything which is outside. And uh, it is a house which, uh, um, you know, was made for her and for her family. And it's not a house like the Pawnee's house, which is which can adapt and can be loved also by others. It's a house which lots of people have never liked this house. You know, they, because they suffered from the fact that you can't arrive to it with your car, uh, you don't have an easy way down to the, to the sea, it doesn't have a garden. Swimming pools arrived a bit later, of course. Uh, but it is a house which lots of people did not like. I think that, for example, uh, the mother of Barbara, who's sitting in front of me, was a very good friend of my parents. I think that your mother did not like the house. Your father did not like the house. Well, you see, it's a house which, which kind of forces you to, to uh, confess. You know, it's not, you can't be indifferent to a house like this. But I, I still think um, your mother has it right that it's not really a holiday house, and I think uh, Ponis's houses are holiday houses. But if I, it's if it's not a holiday house, what is it? I, well, it's a house that has a certain ritual to it, I think, or invites rituals. And they're not necessarily vacational. The duties. My brother and myself had duties for most of the day. But even, but even playing tennis was a duty. But even staying there, it, it, invites, <laughs> those, it invites those duties, the rhythm of what, you know, when you sit at the table, when you go for your swim, and when you watch the boats go by. Even there's a certain duty to when you feel um, exposed that it is a it is a kind of bunker but it also feels rather precarious too i've lived in cities all my life but i've never felt more timid than i have when i'm staying in that house timid in the sense of respectful no timid like a masked man is going to come and stab me it, so it's like kind of hot there's a kind of horror, horror. It, is, it is a bit of a horror yes yes no in the sense that you are alone with yourself yeah. Even if it's a group of people, you feel a very strong uh, sense of solitude. 
and loneliness. You feel very lonely, I think, when you are in that house. But is that because of the house or because of the landscape? I think it's because of both. I think it's the house which makes this uh, aspect of the landscape perceivable. If the house was, you know, gimmicky and playful, you would have some companions. But since the house doesn't help you overcome this timidness, then it becomes problematic. So it's very true to the place. It's, it's, it's very true to Sardinia, I would say, yes. It's very true. To, I think Sardinia as, as a region also contains some of these elements. That, you know, I, I think that uh, having a conversation with someone from Sardinia, in general, it's very difficult. So would you say it's a specific culture? I think that the good conquerors of that generation, in a way, um, did something which is uh, strongly respectful of the mind of the Sardinian people. So it was far from their I I intentions to change the identity of Sardinia, which is what the Costa Smeralda wanted to do. You know, the Costa Smeralda was there to say, look, you fools, you have, you know, you, are, you have a landscape which is worth trillions of dollars, why don't you use it? That was the, the sort of lessons of the conquistadores of the Costa Smeralda. But I think that the good, uh, the good colonialists early colonialist, and I think among these there was also Cini Boeri, who was, also belongs to that group. They were very respectful of the solitude of Sardinia, because that is what they wanted during the summer months. A real break, a big, a big break. Yes. So they were very respectful of things. And the locals uh, uh, in Sardinia who go there in the winter to fish uh, are very respectful of the house as well, maybe because they, they perceive what the original intentions were. This is my, my wish, at least, yes. So who is the new owner? The new owner is, I, I haven't met him. I, I've just met him someone who had the power to overturn it, to sign. Uh, and apparently he's uh, half uh, Venetian and half from Ticino. His name is Ralph, but I don't know the surname. <laughs> I'm quite terrified that he's going to sue me for the book. In fact. Me, me you, too. you will hear if this happens. And uh, I hear t I had two different versions of what he wants to do with the house. Okay. Uh, one version is that he wants it to be a hermitage only for himself and his family, and he wants uh, you know, to keep it exactly as it is, just improve a few things which need upgrading and renovation, but to, that he wants it as it is, he wants to keep it as it is, uh, and therefore very little communication with the external world and uh, very secluded. The other version is that he wants to redo it completely and that he wants to rent it for 30,000 euros a week. So I don't know where the truth is. And I also know that it's either one or the other. I think it's very complicated to keep a middle ground. In the world of today, I think it's difficult. Uh, you're speaking about uh, Italian Sardinian story, family uh, story, personal story, psychoanalytic story, if I can say so. Oh, thanks. Uh, but it's an Italian story, so it's uh, but you have a, a such an official story. Is there a possibility to create an Italian edition of the book? Uh, I hope so. I hope so. I, in my notes, I did write down that it is a paradox uh, that I am Italian that uh, the house is in Italy and that uh, the, the book was written in Italian because I had it translated after, after all. Uh, so uh, I hope there will be an Italian edition of the book. I must confess that I think that the state 
of uh, architectural uh, publishing in Italy is very, very poor at the moment. I think that quite a few people, there are quite a few people here who work in the Italian publishing world. And I think the Italian publishing scene at the moment is very low. And that the, uh, the readiness to take some risks is extremely low. And I think that I'm, of course, extremely grateful to Tom for having taken this risk. Because I think that you must have explained to your bosses that you wanted to make a book on this house. And they must have looked at you saying that, you know, they wanted a book on Gary instead, you know, probably something they like did, that. They did, yeah. They well, did. They, they want Harry Potter. Or Harry Potter. Well, they want either Jacques Derrida or Harry Potter. Exactly. And this is neither yet. And so uh, in the 1970s, uh, Italy was very active, the architectural publishing in Italy. And Italy was publishing books from the foreign world. They were being first published in Italy. Now the situation, I think, is inverted. But it, it also becomes like a game of Chinese whispers when the book written in Italian appears in English and then hopefully appears in Italian. But it might even appear in Spanish. <laughs> MIT will now sell the book as a language. Is this, are you... I, I is mean, this, yeah, it's a possibility. Oh, well, yeah. We need some wine. <laughs> it's also an interesting way of talking about architecture. I mean, talk, you have been changing the publishing industry for a few years now. We are very grateful for that. Really, the narrative is quite important. It's not about technical issues. It's just about telling the story about how you look at how, how you experience the space. <laughs> Make it real. Yeah, or even simply talking about architecture through um, a house. I mean, especially in America, which in, in academic terms has kind of forgotten buildings. Completely, yeah. And, and so it's a different discourse. Architecture in America is, is a bit of philosophy and a bit of kind of economics and political theory and a kind of critical theory. It's as if it's a game played to talk about everything except buildings. And so I wanted not, not just to bring back a building, but to bring back a way of writing that, that isn't by an academic, or is a way of writing that everyone can understand, because it's about um, a family and about a life. So it's, it's also a kind of polemic in my sense, trying to, it's a hand grenade, really. It is also embattled, it's me trying to attack the American Academy or academic publishing, for sure. Yes, for me, it's, uh, it's, um, I also realized that it's very difficult to understand architecture and to talk about it, excluding the individual perception of things. So even when, you know, great architects of the 20th century you know, Gropius or Mies van der Rohe or, you know, Louis Kahn, just to choose three, you know, adopted American architects. It's very hard, I think, to understand their work excluding individual aspects of their life. So from this house, I think that for me, what is in was interesting besides this sort of psychoanalytical aspect, which I think is, uh, is, uh, is important, was also you know, coming to terms with the individuality of the people and of the situation, which made that project possible. So, in a way, closing the lens, you know, rather than, of course, then you need to open it in other directions, etc. But uh, I think that the individuality of architectural projects is an important aspect as well. But, but I think you do that, you, you're... Modesty is preventing you saying that, but I think you do that very adeptly because I think when you talk about one's own life or read architecture through one's own experiences, writing in the first person, so I did this and I did that, it, you're walking a tightrope uh, in, into sort of a kind of narcissism and a kind of um, the idiosyncrasies of just of a kind of one's own arrogance. But I think you handle it very, very nicely. It's still, it still, it has all of the, 
it reads like a diary, but it also reads like something that is about architecture and about Italy and about holidays. Mm. So it, it passes the test, I think, of a scholarly book, an academic book as well. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.